can get. All right, I think we should be good to go. Let's go ahead and start off with a quick word of prayer. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your provision in our lives. We thank you for your hand of protection during this time. We thank you for knowing what our needs are before we even know them. We thank you for being faithful when we bring those needs to you that you would provide and you would look out for us. We thank you for your faithfulness to your word. We thank you that when we come to you looking for wisdom and understanding that you've promised to pour it out and that you're faithful to that if we, if we make an effort to do so. We pray, Father, that tonight you would be with us, that you would set apart this time to be led by your Holy Spirit into your truth, into your wisdom, that we could be sanctified, that we could be worked on by your word, and that we could be refined. Father, that we could come out the other end with a greater understanding. We pray that your truth would be revealed, that you would show us what you've authored in your word, and that you would help us to let go of the things that we hold on to that are not your truth or not your word, and that we would be hungry for your word alone. Be with us tonight. Lead us with your spirit, Father, into your truth. Anoint this time as we fellowship. We give you praise for the work that you're doing in this group and the work that you've promised to do if we remain faithful. We give you praise and honor and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're on Thessalonians chapter 4 today. Um, what are a couple of high points from what we studied uh, last week? We studied chapter 2 and chapter 3. What was Paul writing to the church? What was he telling the Thessalonians in those last two chapters? Does anybody have any notes or anybody remember? Well, he was just giving them like a pat on the back, right? Yeah, right, essentially. He was telling them, hey, you guys have been doing a great job. Here's how I know you've been doing a great job. You've been a great example. Right, he gave them a really high compliment, saying that when the the Lord returns before the Lord, they the church in Thess, uh, Thessaloniki is going to be glory and joy for him. Right, that's a very high praise. He's saying you guys have been doing great. We read in chapter one how their foundation is firm. Right, it's a solid foundation. It's a complete foundation, and because of that, they are yielding the fruit of the Spirit. And Paul can see that. We see in chapter two, Paul recounts his suffering in Philippi as well as the persecution he faced while he was with the Thessalonians, right? Reminding them that it wasn't in vain. He wasn't just coming as a false teacher. He was coming with persecution, and that's something they can expect if they follow in his footsteps, which they did, right? He, that's why Timothy had to revisit, because Paul was worried. Hey, you know, I'm worried that we've left, and now this persecution is going to remain, and it's going to affect their faith. But Timothy brought that good report back in chapter 3. In chapter 2, verses 3 through 6, Paul pleads the case for his honesty and hard work while he was there. Right? We talked about this as validating his authority, his authenticity. It's separating him from the other wolves, the other false teachers, the people who are writing fake letters. And it's invalidating the, the, the imposters and false teachers that were trying to um, basically trip up the church, uh, the Thessalonians. In verse 13, it's talking about the word is what is at work in believers, right? That's kind of a two-tiered message. It's Jesus that's working in us, and it's the Word of God, i.e. the Bible, the Scriptures, as we read them, those are going to be working in our life. So when Jesus tells us in John 17, 17, and he's praying to the Father, he says, sanctify them by your truth, your Word is truth, he's basically giving us the insight to say that we need the Scripture to structure our lives, and God will use it to work in who we are. Right, we will be changed because of the word, and Jesus will be in that process. So it's kind of a two-tiered message, right? In verses 14 through 16 of chapter two, Paul praises the church while also condemning the Hebrews, basically giving you know giving them a, a verbal lashing for what they're doing to the church and how they have brought God's wrath onto their own head. But he's also giving them a you know a thumbs up, saying, "Hey, you've made it through the persecution. You guys are doing great. You know, keep on, keep it on." Basically, now chapter three, we have. Timothy brings Paul the encouraging report, right? Paul was concerned. He was in Athens. He was him, Silas, and Timothy. He sends Timothy back to report, gives Timothy in the letter, hey, this is, you know, this is my guy. He's a good dude. He's serving the Lord as well. 
And when he returned to me, he gave me the report that you guys are doing well. So that was encouraging to me because now my concerns can be put to rest. Right. That's what he's saying. Paul was genuinely concerned that the persecution that followed him right from Philippi to Thessaloniki um, would affect the faith of the Thessalonians because he was only there a short time. Right. Thanks to the report from Timmy, his concerns were put to rest. Now, verse 13, we went in. We went and dug in the word, right? This word saints that appears in the English language, often the King James Version, some of the older ones, this concept saints is loaded, right? It makes us think that it's telling us in verse 13 that Jesus is returning with the dead who have died in him, but we did some due diligence and we realized that the Greek word hagios in Greek is just the word for something that is set apart, right? It's used in the New Testament for a place, God's presence, a city, the temple, people so we can't narrow it down just based on that word alone so then we looked at the concept of where is this event talked about in other areas of scripture right? this return of christ who come with him matthew 28 19 matthew 4 5 matthew 7 6, matthew 24 15 all tell us that angels that are coming with him when he returns okay? it is extremely important when we look at these little nuanced details in scripture like angels return with jesus we made note of that because it contextualizes other small nuanced details that we're going to see over in just a little bit. Okay. So the concept in verse 13 is that he is returning with angels. Okay. If you have any concern, go back and listen to the recording from last week. Go and search those, those Bible verses because they all say that Jesus returns with the angels. Now we looked at why it's angels, right? Why are angels coming with them? They have a purpose and they have work that they're going to be doing. What does scripture tell us that that is? We looked at Matthew chapter 13 and in verse 39, it specifically says this, this wheat and tear judgment is at the end of the age. This is when the angels return to, to basically pull the harvest because the wicked are the tares and the angels come with him to gather them up and cast them into destruction because they're wicked, right? Matthew 13 and specifically verse 39, the hostile one that is sown the tares is the devil. The harvest is at the end of the age. The angels are the ones who are reaping or harvesting. Okay. So he's bringing the angels back. He's going to take care of the wicked. Okay. Other places, this story is shared as angels. We look in Mark 8, 38, Matthew 16, 27, Luke 9, 26, Matthew 25, 31, second Thessalonians 1, 7, Jude 1, 14 alludes to the same thing when it talks about the myriads of hagios or angels, as we see in Deuteronomy 33, 2 and Hebrews 12, 22. So if there's any question when we're not certain when, what something means, we need to use scripture to interpret scripture. And we need to be willing to let go of an idea if it contradicts scripture and create an idea based on the evidence alone, right? We talk about the, we want to be Bereans. That means that we have to do what the Bereans did and hold everything to the standard of scripture and unlearn or be willing to let go of ideas, even if they're very popular or they're well accepted or they're really old because none of those qualify as God's truth. Only the Bible qualifies as God's truth. Okay. I, I preface all of that because we're going to jump into 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and we're going to talk about two or three concepts that are not popularly accepted. And actually the mainstream churches today essentially accept the opposite or they accept the traditional views that don't line up with the entirety of scripture. And unfortunately, we're going to have to jam a lot of it into just a little bit of time. Okay, so bear with me. I'm going to use scriptures. We're going to, we're going to interpret the Bible with what the Bible says to try and form our ideas, and hopefully we don't make more questions than we answer, but we've got a lot to cover. So let's go ahead and jump in. First Thessalonians chapter 4, the first 13 verses are talking about behavioral correction. So Paul is addressing a couple of things that were happening in the church with the Thessalonians that he wanted them to focus on and do better at. Okay, and this is something that we can apply to our own lives as well. We can always do better because there's a purpose behind it, and that purpose is sanctification. Okay, and then verses 13 through 18, turn, he turns the tone to the return of Christ and the details that are going to take place, right, when that event happens. And we're going to narrow down how we know that it's just one event, 
There's not a separate mysterious event that happens, and then later on Jesus is going to come back because Scripture doesn't tell us that in the details, and it actually gives us the clues to understand why all of the different places that Christ's return is talked about are all referencing the same event, right? It's all one event when Christ returns and the dead and the those alive are transformed, okay? So starting off in verse 1 and 2, we see Paul, he says, Furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and we exhort you by the Lord Jesus, that as we have received of us how you ought to walk and please God, so you would abound more and more. For you know that what commandments we gave to you by the Lord Jesus. Okay, so what he's, st he's starting off and saying here, because in verses 3, 4, 5, and 6, we see commandments that Paul is giving to us, and he's putting a little asterisk on there saying that these are been, th these have been, these are been, that's good. These have been revealed to me by the Lord. These are commandments from Jesus. Okay, so when Jesus says, if you love me, you will follow my commandments. He has given us specific commandments in the New Testament that we need to look to. We don't need to look back to the things from before him and apply those commandments to our life, right? People do that. They say, oh, well, Jesus said, follow my commandments, and then they run off to the Mosaic Covenant, and they say, this is, these are the commandments that he was talking about, and they completely miss the concept that Jesus has given us a structure of commandments in the New Testament through his ministry and through his apostles that are things that we have to personally apply to our life. Okay, so that's what he's saying. Paul has shared with them the commandments of how they should walk in order to be pleasing to God, and he also says that these things that he shares, he specifies, these are commandments that you need to follow. So as New Testament believers, we tune in a little bit and say, okay, this means me. If I'm a New Testament believer, if I'm in the covenant of Christ, these are applicable to my life. Okay, so the first one is in verse 3, he says, for this is the will of God that your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. So that's commandment number one. As a Christian, if you're born again, you're going to abstain from fornication, because this will do something that he says in verse three. This is for your sanctification. All right. So these commandments aren't just to follow after, just to be, you know, um, legalistic or just to follow rules to say that we can do it. But the process in this is that we are sanctified when we obey his commandments. Okay, that's something that we should all understand as Christians. If we take initiative, right, to the commandments that God says in Scripture are something we need to follow after, then he steps in and provides the power for us to overcome. Okay, no matter what it is, even if it's not just fornication, if it's any sin that we're struggling with, we take it before God, we say it's a priority, I want this out of my life because you told me I need to and it will bring me closer to you, so I'm going to do what I need to do to handle my end of things, whether it's self-discipline or, you know, not doing things or doing things that you will help you to avoid sin or whatever that might be. And then God said, I will be there to meet you in the middle and I will give you the Holy Spirit so that you can become overcomers of your flesh. Okay. So he's saying, this is the first one I want you guys to focus on. Don't mess with fornication. Okay, so that's the first one. So as Christians, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't think any of us are struggling with that. If we are, um, we should, you know, reflect, repent, take this one to God. But fornication, you know, having sex outside of marriage, doing that outside of the boundary of the covenant he gave to us, that's obviously something that is very displeasing to him, and he considers that a sin. So if we're blatantly doing it or if we're doing it unrepentantly, you know, that's a good way to grieve the spirit and cause problems in our life. So moral of the story is don't be a fornicator, because God doesn't like that. So the second one is that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Okay, what's our vessel? Real quick. We all have one. Our body. Okay, it's our body, right? It's this physical dirt body. Until we're glorified and get a new one, this is the one that we're supposed to be in charge of. It's a temple. Okay, it's going to take work to keep in order. And so we have to discipline ourselves to walk in honor and in sanctification. Right, this is, he's telling us, every one of you, so men and women, should know how to possess their vessel in sanctification and honor. Honoring your body to be honoring to God. Living in sanctification to die to sin. Okay, this is a second command. So first one, don't fornicate. Second one, walk in sanctification, live honorably. Right, don't ruin your testimony that you're a Christian by following after the lust of your flesh. Right, whatever that may be, however that manifests itself. Okay, now verse five, not in the lust of co um, concupiscence, but even as the Gentiles which know not God. So now the, here's the third one: don't like he's he's broadening the scope. Don't fall into the lust that the Gentiles follow after because they don't know God. 
right? And lust can be impulsive, emotional uh, desires, can be sexual, can be material, whatever it is that you're desiring as a result of your body, right? Comfort, um, you know, whatever it is. It can, be an, it can be kind of a short list of things that can be a lust of the flesh. He's saying, don't walk after those because the world does. You need to be holy and set apart and be different, right? So now we've gone from fornication to walking in honor and sanctification to don't even let lust be an issue. He says in verse 6 that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, but because that the Lord is the avenger of all, such as, excuse me, we have all forewarned you and testified. For God has not called us into uncleanness, but into holiness. Okay, so Paul is writing to the church and to the, to the Thessalonians here that they need to take part in that process of sanctification. God is not just going to do it. We don't get to just sit back and say, well, when God's timing is perfect, he's going to make it happen in my life. I'm struggling with sin. I'm just going to sit back and wait. No, it, there is a process where we have to take that before God. We have to take the initiative and say, God, these are a problem. I need you to help me with these. And what that does is that shows him that we're taking it seriously. Right, because that's what he's about. He wants worship that's serious. He wants us to live the, a life that's set apart. He wants us to seek the gifts. He wants us to show him, right? He says what? Draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. Show the initiative, and I will meet you where you come to see me. Okay, we see that message all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. We have to go to him, and he's promised to be faithful to be there when we do. And sometimes that requires stepping out in faith. Okay, so are there any questions? Because we've just gotten here. You can highlight three, four, five, and six and write a note next to them. Say, these are, these are commandments for me, not just Thessalonians. I need to follow these and obey these because these are commands given from, from Jesus to Paul. Paul says, these are commands from the Lord. So if you're concerned, if you're looking back to the Old Testament for direction, you know, refocus and look at, God, at Christ's ministry and look at the covenant and the boundaries he's given to us and follow those commands and you'll see the fruit of the Spirit working in your life. That's how it works. It's very simple. It's a simple concept, but it's hard to follow. Right? It's hard to actually act out. Okay, now he says in verse 8, 9, and 10, he says, He therefore that despises, despises not man but God, who has also given unto us his Holy Spirit. But as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, for you yourselves are taught of God to love one another, and indeed you do it towards all the brethren, which are in all Macedonia, but we beseech you, brethren, that you increase more and more. Okay, so in verse 8, what he's telling us here is God considers it a sin against himself when we despise others. Okay, this one carries some, some weight, because it's really easy to not like other people. It's easy to despise them in our hearts, right? And it's important to understand this, the distinction, because I shared in the previous Bible studies, the one last time and the time before, where in Second Peter, he gives us this formula or these steps that we need to take as we mature as Christians. And the last two are brotherly love for the body and the love of Christ for all men. And Paul is addressing both of those here. So that tells us that the church in, in the Thessalonians were actually very mature. Because they were on the last two steps. He says, he actually says, as in concerning brotherly love or, or love for the body of Christ, you guys are doing good. We just ask you to do it more. But remember, when you hate the people outside of the body, God considers that as if you hated him. And that's not something we like to do because it's easy to love those who are like-minded. It's easy to say, yeah, I've picked my congregation. I'm in my, I'm in my family. I agree with these people, at least to, for the most part, and it's easier for me to show love for them. But what about the people that mock me for being a Christian? Or what about the people that hate me or won't accept my help or my free help or me trying to do something for them in the name of Christ or don't want to listen to my testimony and mock me and persecute me and spit on me? Like those people, God says, don't despise them because it's like you despise him when you do that. Why does he compare the lost and despising them to despising himself. Does that make sense? Why does God consider that a sin against himself when we don't like people who aren't saved? We should be able to answer this, or at least try. Because, <laughs> because we, are, we, all, we all were lost like that before we got saved, and he... He had mercy on us. Like he waited, he, he waited for us and he had mercy on us. So we should have 
uh, empathy for that. Yeah, and exactly. We don't deserve what God has given to us, just like they don't deserve what God has given to them. And just because we found it doesn't make us better than them. And God says, in fact, we should lower ourselves below them to become servants to them because the image of Christ is going to look like a servant who shows love and mercy to someone who doesn't deserve it. And we can't even practice that on people that we agree with, let alone people that are outside of the body. That's why we have so few people that look like the image of Christ out there working for God's will because they're too self-centered and too prideful to be able to lower themselves to a servant, even to the people in the body of believers. Right? So in that, in that chain that, Paul, or that Peter writes to us in 2 Peter, everyone's still on step one. And God is looking for people who are going to be faithful enough to be sanctified up those steps and make it to step you know, five and six to be able to love the body as a servant and to love other men in the way Christ loved other men. And that's not to say that's so he's saying this if we take the context of Second Peter in line with this, we can see that the Thessalonians are mature. They have the Holy Spirit working. They're doing great on that second to last step where they're loving the body. But Paul is saying, don't forget, you also need to love all of mankind. And he says, because at the, at the end of verse 8, uh, who is also given unto us his Holy Spirit. So it is not impossible for us to do this. We have to identify that it's a weakness and let the Holy Spirit do his work in that weakness. You've been given the tools. There's no reason that you can't get there. Paul is reminding them that, you know, there, this is a serious thing. I need you guys to focus on this. But you guys are still doing pretty good when it comes to loving brothers, especially all the churches in Macedonia, he says. And I just ask that you guys would continue to focus on that and do better. Okay, we turn it to us, we apply it to our lives. How can we show that servitude to the body so that we can develop that like mind for those who are lost? How can we be servants to those who are lost? Because I'll tell you this, you cannot be a servant in the way Christ is to the lost until you can do it to the body first. That's just how it is. And the body is supposed to be the easy mode and then the lost is supposed to be the hard mode. So there's a progression that's involved. So if we're struggling with any of them, we need to go back and find out where it is that we're, you know, what the root of the problem is and address it there and not just address the symptoms and pretend to show concern for those who are lost, but ask God, change my heart so that I see them like you do. Give me your spirit to humble me and make me meek so I can be a servant to those people who are lost. Okay. Aside from that, the Thessalonians, they're doing awesome, right? Those are really the only two corrections that we see here, you know, abstain from sexual immorality, you know, do better in loving others. He's going he's gonna to talk about in the next verse a little bit about working, right? So being diligent workers, that's not a sin. We just know that being lazy has consequences. We saw that all throughout uh, the uh, book of Proverbs, right? But so he's encouraging them. He says in verse 11, and you study to be quiet, so you do your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you, that you may walk honestly towards them that are without and that you may have lack of nothing. Be diligent workers, right? What's this first thing he says? And you study to be quiet, this is a concept we saw all throughout Proverbs. Why would studying produce being quiet? What, what's that word that we talked about like six or seven times? When you know what to say and what not to say, when you can keep your mouth shut. Discernment. Close. I guess technically discernment would be a result of it, but Proverbs tells us discretion. Right. So we have discretion. We know when to say something, when not to say something, when to keep our mouth shut. And that is a result of gaining wisdom. So Paul is telling them here, if you study scripture and search for wisdom, you will learn to, you know, you'll know when to be quiet. It sounds like they were having an issue with gossiping, right, to do your own business. So it sounds like they were, there may, be, may have been some issues with gossiping and may have been some issues with, you know, lack of wisdom and when to say things and when to use discretion. So he's telling them, study. Right? Gain wisdom from scripture, and as a result, you'll keep to yourself, you'll know what to say, what not to say, and then he also tells them, make sure that you're working, being diligent, and providing your own way so that before others who don't have things, right, you're, not, you're, you're honest before them, right? the people who have nothing and the people who lack, you're not going to look bad by taking handouts when you're fully capable of you know, earning your own way, making your own way, when others aren't able to and they do actually need help. Right. So that should just be kind of a, a motivation and encouragement to us. Don't be lazy. Keep studying. Seek to discern, seek discernment, that type of thing, so that you can be a good example to other people in the body and other people that are looking at looking into us. OK. So that was a quick breeze through the first section. Anybody have any questions on any of those verses or anything we just covered? 
Is it about to get a little bit hairy? Probably some, maybe a little uncomfortable, but we'll see. We're going to start in verse 13, and we're going to look at some concepts, try to lay the foundation for what Paul is writing to us in regards to Christ's return. Okay? So, verse 13 he says, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. So the first thing he's telling them is, I don't want you to be ignorant when it comes to things dealing with death and the future promises that we have of Scripture. So when people in the church tell you, we just can't know until we get to heaven, flee from them and do not let them influence what you believe about the truth of God's word, because they are not in line with what Paul is writing here and the other apostles in that we need to know God has given us the the tools and resources to understand his plan, but we have to be willing to seek the truth to get it. So that's the first thing. We should not be ignorant when it comes to eschatology. Okay, it's tough, it's difficult, but God has the foundation in his word, and if we're hungry for it, he will give it to us. So there should never be an excuse as to not know what's going on, because if we remember, Jesus rebuked the Pharisees for not knowing the signs that he was there. Right, they should have known. The Magi knew, right? Those who were paying attention knew. They saw the signs of the miracles through John the Baptist and his family. They saw the signs in the stars. They knew what was going on, and they knew the, what they were looking for. And the Pharisees were like, no, no, we don't think so, right? And then once they were kind of caught with their pants down, they went back and were able to validate in Scripture, okay, right? We see this with Herod as well, right? His scribes went into the Scripture and said, okay, where's this person supposed to come from? And that's why we see Herod trying to go out and kill people, because God has given us the clues. They're in there. He's going to tell us what his plan entails, and those who are paying attention are going to know. So take that as you will, right? If eschatology is hard and scary, then we need to dig in and ask God to help us to understand what it is, okay? Because we should know. But I would not have you be ignorant. This is one of those few things Paul says, you need to know and if it's up to me, I'm going to make sure that you're not ignorant because you need to know. This affects your faith. This affects what you're going to experience based on whether or not you've studied to know what God is saying he's going to do. Now, second thing, what happens, verse 13, he says, Brethren, concerning them which are asleep. Who are Who is asleep? Well, who is that a description of? Uh, people that we have lost. Yes, right? People who have died before us. Now, there's a lot of bad concepts that are floating out around there, thanks to the Catholic Church, about immediate judgment, things that are happening in the afterlife, purgatory, things of that nature. But Scripture tells us that when you die, you wait. Okay? It tells us that when you die, you are waiting for a future judgment. There are two that are going to take place. You're either part of the first one, to eternal glory, right? Eternal life. And the second one is to... to uh, to judgment at the end of the thousand year reign. Okay, so when the dead die, if we look at scripture, here's a couple of things that we can pull, up, pull out here. The first thing is that when the dead die, they know nothing. Okay, Ecclesiastes 9.5. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. They have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Okay, so Solomon is telling us in Ecclesiastes that when you die, you know nothing. You're not conscious. Okay, you're not anywhere because you have, you have no, no thought or no knowledge going on, you die, and that's why we see all over Scripture this concept that you're sleeping. That's the best description that we can put together for what happens when you die and lose consciousness, right? If anybody's ever been in surgery and they knock you out with this, the anesthetic, you're not dreaming, you know nothing, you've, you're basically like a living, you're dead in your vessel until you come out of that uh, little mini coma, so to speak, and that would, I would say that that's probably a good um, comparison to what's going on when you die. Because you wake up and you have no idea how long, uh, how much time has passed. You know nothing. You have no plans. You have no dreams. Literally nothing is going on in your brain. So you're basically, quote unquote, dead. Okay. We also see that in Ecclesiastes 9.10 that the, that the dead have no knowledge, no thought, and no wisdom. Right? Ecclesiastes 9.10. For whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol. Right? This is the grave. What we would translate in English is... People would call it hell or the grave, right, to which you are going. So in Ecclesiastes 9.5, they tell, he tells us that they know nothing. He says again in 9.10 that there's no knowledge, there's no thought, there's no wisdom. So there's no active, you're not hanging around waiting for judgment, you're not in a purgatory, 
right? You're not hanging out in heaven. You haven't gone anywhere because you go to the dirt, right? In Psalms 146, 4, we see that the dead, th the thoughts of the dead perish when they die. It says his breath goes forth. He returns to his earth. In that very day, his thoughts perish. Okay, so when you die, we're, we're building the case here that essentially nothing happens. You're, you're done. That's it. Okay, in Daniel 12, 2, this talks about the judgments, right? And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to everlasting contempt. So this is a description of the two judgments, right? We also see this in Isaiah 26, 19. John tells us the same thing in the New Testament. So there's no, we're not just camping in the Old Testament here. John tells us that do not, in John 5, 28, do not be amazed at this, for the hour is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice. Right? They're going to hear his voice at the hour that he returns. That's when we see the dead raised, which he's going to talk about here in a little bit, and transformed. They're going to hear the, the voice of the Lord. Okay? And until then, they don't hear his voice. Right? If they're up in heaven hanging out with Jesus, there's no, you know, they're not mute or they're not deaf in heaven. Right? They're not hanging out up there. What it's telling us is that when they're in the grave, they hear nothing. Right? They don't hear the Lord's voice until he's going to return, and that's what John tells us. In Psalm 6, 5, we're told that the dead have no praise. Right, Among the dead, no one proclaims your name. Who praises you from the grave? Question mark. So no one can proclaim his name. No one can uh, praise them from the grave. Psalm 115, 17. It is not the dead who praise the Lord, nor any who descend into silence. Okay, so the dead can't praise the Lord because they've descended into this sleep. Right? There's no hope. Isaiah 38, 18 tells us that the dead have no hope. They're not, they're not conscious to have a hope of a future or anything in regards to that. For Sheol cannot thank you. Death cannot praise you. Those who go down into the pit cannot hope for your faithfulness. Okay, so what Scripture is telling us, essentially, the picture should be pretty clear here, that when we die, there's no thought, there's nothing going on, there's no consciousness. We're unable to form... Um, thoughts there's no wisdom there's no understanding we don't have a hope of something in the future we can't praise the lord we can't hear his voice we're not going to hear it until we return so then we have to ask the question what happens when we do die okay scripture is clear it tells us that the spirit that god has breathed into our life goes back to him okay and when i say god who has given us this spirit scripture tells us it is the father who is in charge of giving all of all of mankind his spirit even the animals Ecclesiastes 12.7 says, let's pull this one up because I didn't write it down. Uh, Ecclesiastes 12.7 tells us that then the dust shall return to the earth as it was, right? Talking about our dust vessel, what we were made out of, as in Adam was made from the dust. And then it says, and the spirit shall return to God who gave it. Okay. When we look at this concept, and we're breezing through a lot just for the sake of time here, so I'm trying to condense a lot of this. But when we see when the Bible talks about this spirit, this ruach, right, this breath that God has given to us, that is what sustains us as living beings. And that's why when you look at this concept in Scripture, you can see God's sovereignty and mercy because he also sustains the life of the wicked who don't love him, who hate him, and don't want to be with him. He sustains them in the same way he sustains life with us, right? It is through his spirit. When the scripture says spirit, it's not talking about our soul. It is our soul that will be judged before the Lord and will be destroyed if we are wicked, according to what scripture tells us. So the spirit is separate from that, according to the Bible. And when we die, this spirit is basically pulled back up and it's returned to the Lord and our bodies go into the grave and we know nothing. We wait for a future judgment. And if we've died in the faith, we get to take place in that first resurrection. And that's what Paul is about to tell us about here. Okay, for some surrounding or some uh, um, some supporting verses on that concept when it comes to the spirit, Numbers twenty seven sixteen tells us the same thing. It says, "Let Jehovah, the God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint a man over the congregation." God has the title. The Father Jehovah has the title as the God of the spirits of all flesh, both wicked and saved. Job thirty four fourteen and fifteen tells us the same thing. Job 34, verse 14 and 15, he sets his heart on him. 
if he gathers his spirit and breath and breath and his breath to himself, talking about the father, right? If the father sets his heart on him, and if the father gathers his spirit and his breath to himself, all flesh shall perish together and man shall return to dust. Saying if he wanted to revoke his spirit from the earth, all of mankind would return to the dust because it is his spirit that he has breathed into us, okay, that sustains our life. This is important to distinguish that this is not the Holy Spirit. This is different. Okay, the Holy Spirit has the title of being the Holy Spirit, and it's only given to those who are Christians. The Spirit that God breathed into mankind to live is the Spirit that's being talked about here. Okay, Psalms 104, 29 tells us the same thing. 104, 29 tells us that you hide your face and they are troubled. You gather their breath, right, and they expire and return to their dust. This breath, this ruach, this spirit that he's breathed into us, this life force, when he re when it returns to him, we return to the dust. Okay, Psalms 146, 4. Tells us his breath will go out, he returns to the earth, and then his thoughts perish in that day. So there's no more consciousness, there's no more sentience, we're not making any plans, we don't have anything going forward. Essentially, we go go to nap time, and then the next thing that we see, the next thing that we know is the resurrection. And if we're saved, it's to see the Lord, and if we're not, it's to see destruction. Okay, now, death is referred to as sleep in a number of verses. So take, take your time, do your homework, go and do word searches on Scripture, and look at all of the different places that this sleep is referred to in Scripture. Here's a really good one from David in Psalm 13, 3. Consider me an answer, O Lord, my God, right? O Jehovah, my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, right? Lest I go into this sleep, I go into this unconsciousness that is considered to be death, right? He's describing it. We see it in 1 Corinthians 15, 6, Daniel 12, 2, Matthew 27, 52, Acts 7, 60, John 11, 11 through 14, 1 Corinthians 15, 20, 1 Thessalonians 4, 15. We're going to read that one today. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, 2 Peter 3, 4, Ephesians 5, 14, the list goes on. This concept is that when we die, we go into this quote-unquote sleep, for lack of a better term. We know nothing. There's no plans. We don't praise the Lord. We're, there's no wisdom or thought or understanding. We can't, um, we can't hear the Lord's voice. We're basically in a state waiting for a future judgment. Okay? So that is a... You know, five-hour discourse jam-packed into three points with a bunch of Bible verses. Does that make sense? Because that's setting the foundation for what we're going to look at next. You don't have to just take my word for it on all of the points that I've provided. Go and do your homework, right? Use the Old Testament and the New Testament. Use the whole of Scripture. Uh, Billy, did you have a question? No, no. Go, go on, carry on. Okay, so this is not a yeah. This is not a popular topic, right? Everybody wants to think that when you die, you go to heaven, right? There's an immediate judgment. We got to go be in the presence of the Lord. John three thirteen tells us that no one's been in the throne room but Jesus, right? When he returns and sees Mary, what does he say? He says, "Don't touch me because I haven't gone before the Father." And he was dead for three days, right? So there's all of these little nuggets that we see in the in the New Testament about the fact that when you die, there's nothing. You are waiting for a future judgment, okay? And either it's one of two judgments: you get a good one or you get a bad one. We see the parable of the uh, payment um, from the uh, the guy who hired all the different work hands at the different intervals of the day, and he pays them all at the same time, right? That's the same concept that at the end of the age, everybody who has died in the faith, both before Christ and after Christ, gets paid eternal life at the same time, regardless of how long you've been working in that plan, right? So there's all of these different things. We have a couple of scriptures that are present in the in the, um, in the Bible where a lot of people try to read ideas into them and presuppose that they mean something, and then they will not address any of these verses that contradict those concepts of immediate judgment or purgatory or going to heaven immediately or going to hell immediately, and they generally tend to camp on those Bible verses until, you know, that's the hill they choose to die on, but we have to take the whole witness of Scripture, and all of these verses I've given to you, plus all of the other ones that I haven't, go and do your homework, formulate the concept, but understand that according to the Bible, you die, you wait. If you die, you don't know anything. There's no judgment. You're not in heaven. That way, that's why when you see these people dealing with mediums and doing seances to talk to dead people, Scripture tells us that they're dealing with familiar spirits. You're not actually contacting people who have died and gone to the other side. You can't get to them because they're in the grave and they know nothing. 
right? We look at Hebrews chapter 11, where we have all of these pillars of faith who have died, and they spe it specifically says that they were all in the faith, and they're all going to receive the inheritance, but when they died, they're still waiting to receive that because that payday hasn't come yet. Okay? So that is the foundation because he says in the next verse something very specific that a lot of people get tripped up on when it comes to who comes back with Jesus. Okay, so that's, that's the first part of verse 13. He also says in verse 13, don't be sad and hopeless like the world when it comes to death. Right. The Thessalonians were struggling. It sounds like they had some people that were persecuted and potentially even died for the name of Jesus. And they were just yeah, they were getting discouraged because they didn't necessarily know what was going on. Right. They didn't necessarily know what the truth was when it comes to what happens when we die. And we know, based on what he was talking about in the first couple of chapters, that they were coming from idolatrous religions. They were coming from pagan religions. So they probably had some bad ideas as to you know, what happens when you die? They may have thought that they were going to hell if they didn't die in the right way, or they had some, some, you know, some, um, depending on the religion, some sort of reincarnation or whatever it might be, but that there's something that goes on after death. And so they may have been discouraged. So Paul was trying to clear this up. Don't be discouraged. We get hope because we're Christians because of the promises of what Jesus gave to us, right? He alluded to in the first chapter and the second chapter that did, because of Jesus, we've been saved from wrath. So we get a hope that the next thing that we see is the Lord and not destruction. We don't have to worry about it because we're Christians and we have exclusive perks. Okay, so we have a hope, right? When you're dead. Obviously, he wasn't reading in all of the different things that we just talked about with the dead not knowing anything, but that is a requirement for a biblical foundation in order to understand what the future hope and the future promises are, right? It gets hairy and it gets murky when you have bad ideas that you're trying to fit into eschatology or into the future promises. They won't make sense, and you'll have to go based off of man's wisdom and man's reasoning in order to make it make sense, and then you're, you know, you're basically walking off into deception. Okay, so that's the thing of verse, verse 13. The dead have a hope. The dead are asleep. That future promise is what he's going to tell us about right here in verse 14. So he says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with them. Okay, now when we looked at all of those verses about the spirit, our spirit returns to God the Father. Right? Job tells us it's God the Father who is the author of all the spirits. If he were to withdraw them, all of mankind would die. It's the Father withdrawing the spirits. So it would make sense that in verse 14, that when Jesus returns with his angels, there's a specific promise that God the Father will, in fact, bring those spirits back to those who are going to be resurrected. Right? This is in context of Scripture. When we see in uh, Ecclesiastes 12.7, the spirit returns to God. And then at the resurrection, he says here in verse 14, God will bring those spirits back with him. He is not telling us that the souls are coming back with him when Christ returns. Okay, because the soul is different from the spirit. Okay, we see this all in scripture. God says, be, be, you know, don't be worried about the one who can destroy your body, but be worried about the one who can destroy your body and your soul in hell. Okay, your soul is what's going to face judgment. Your soul is what's going to be receiving a new, immaterial, perfect, uh, incorruptible body. Right? We're going to get rid of this vessel. We're going to put on a new vessel that's going to have glory and hope of the future. And the spirit is what God breathes into us to animate us and to give us consciousness so that we can essentially, quote unquote, live. Okay, so he's saying when Jesus returns, those who have died in the faith of Christ, okay, will be resurrected by God the Father because he is the one who is the author of life for all of mankind. Now, the reason that we're looking at this, we need to be a little bit more in depth. Who raised Jesus from the dead? Did Jesus raise Jesus from the dead? Or did Jehovah uh, raise Jesus from the dead? What does scripture tell us? Jehovah. Okay, Harry is correct. Jehovah, the Father, is specified all over Scripture. It's 11 different times in Acts alone where it specifically says that God the Father resurrected Jesus. We need to know this specific detail because our promise in the future is that because God raised Jesus, God will raise those who are dead in Jesus. Acts 2.32, God has raised Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses of it. 
Acts 2.24, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death. Acts 3.15, you killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. Acts 4.10, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. Okay, 11 different times in Acts in 1 Corinthians 6.14, and God who both raised up the Lord Jesus, and he will raise us through his power. 1 Corinthians 15, 15, in that case, we are exposed as a false witness about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, and if he did not raise him, then the dead are not raised. So Paul is writing, God the Father is the one who raised Jesus, and as part of our future hope, which he's telling us here in verse 14, God will raise us who are also dead in the faith. Okay, 2 Corinthians 4.14, knowing then that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle, sent forth from, uh, sent not forth uh, by, for men or by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Ephesians 1.20, he, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. You can also see Colossians 2.12. Okay, so to compartmentalize the promise, Paul is saying God raised Jesus from the dead. Read 1 Corinthians 15. That's his testimony. That's his witness to say we all saw Christ raised from the dead. And as a result, the same God who has the power to defeat death and resurrect Jesus from the dead has in fact promised that those who are his will also be resurrected from the dead and God the Father is going to be the one to do it. Okay, it's a specific promise so that we can have a specific hope in the future. So if we die, if we die tomorrow, we have a hope, right? We can have an assurance that the very next thing we will see is the Lord Jesus Christ when he returns to get us and God the Father is going to be the one to raise us from the dead. If we're alive, great. Paul's going to tell us that the dead are actually raised first. So we will not go before the dead when it comes to meeting the Lord. Okay, so... Question is, who raises the dead? Answer, God raises the dead. Jehovah the Father raises the dead. So in Ecclesiastes 12, 7, when the Spirit returns to Jehovah and those judgments take place, God's also going to raise the dead who are wicked, but they're going to be raised to a judgment and then to destruction. Okay, that's what Scripture tells us. Now, that's not our hope. We can study that at another time, but that's what we're looking at when we see the concept that God will resurrect those who have died to either judgment, and you better hope that you died in the faith, because if you have to go to the judgment— you're going to be pretty upset, especially if you called yourself a Christian in this life. Okay? So verse 14 tells us, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, which he did, even so them who which, uh, even, even so them also who sleep, right, those who were dead, in Jesus, God will bring their spirit, he will resurrect them, and he will give them eternal life in a new vessel, right? They'll be transformed, which he tells us in verse 15. For, the, for this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain into the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Okay, so we've laid the foundation. Paul says, by revelation from Jesus, okay, Jesus has shown me these things himself. Those who are alive at Jesus' return will not go before those who have died. There's a couple of things that we can pull from this. When Satan has dominion and Satan has been thrown to the earth and he is performing signs and wonders and miracles as to deceive, he cannot replicate or counterfeit resurrecting the dead around the world to go and meet him in the air. Okay, that is our hope. When people say they've come, they've returned their, the Messiah and they're doing miracles, we can say, if you are not in the air and I am not there to see you and the dead have risen to go before me, I know that this isn't the... It's important to understand this because the things that we're going to see in the future, and, and Scripture doesn't tell us that... that uh, Satan's going to counterfeit um, the resurrection, but based on his character, based on what we see him in the future, what's talked about in Revelation and Daniel and Ezekiel and Isaiah, it's a safe bet that he's going to try and pull something off and fake a resurrection. Right? He's going to try to fake a rapture. He's going to try and fake a return of, quote-unquote, a Jesus or a Christ that he's going to look like, and it's going to fool the majority of people who call themselves Christians and as well the Hebrews. But Paul is giving us this promise and laying the foundation that unless you see him in the air, it's not, it's, not, it's not Jesus. Okay, and he's also telling us that unless the dead who were in the graves go before you, then it's not Jesus. 
Okay, so there's, those are two different ways we can understand what the sign of Jesus' return is going to be. Okay, he very specifically says that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will not prevent them which are asleep. And he says it again in verse 17, but in 16, he says, For the Lord himself, Jesus himself, will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Okay, so what he's saying here is that the dead are going to be resurrected. How do we know? Was there an event that had happened before when he was here the first time? There was a shadow of what's going to happen when he returns. Can anybody think of anything? Yeah, when the, I think when the temple broke, the, every, the saints came out of their graves and yep. went to meet Yep, that's exactly what it says. It says they were a first fruit, right? Those who had died in the faith were resurrected with Christ, and they went into the city to be witnessed by many. Okay, that's a freaky thing to think about. There were people that came back to life, went into the city, and went and were, and were witnessed by people who knew they had died. Okay, I believe that that's going to be what the counterfeit looks like, because Satan is going to emulate Christ's ministry on earth, so he's going to be able to quote unquote, bring these angelic beings forward and say, these are the resurrected dead. And that's just conjecture. Okay. That's just my, my educated guess based on what we see in scripture. But why would Paul need to warn us that we're only going to see him in the air and we're only going to go after the dead have been resurrected if that wasn't pertinent information, right? So take that with a grain of salt. Um, that's just kind of a conjecture, kind of a, a best guess as to what we can, we can expect in the future. But just remember that the Hebrews are going to accept this Antichrist as their Mashiach ben David. He's going to come and do what Jesus did, but he's also going to do it politically and uh, through warfare. So he's going to be both sides of the coin. And so he's going to basically copycat what Jesus did the first time. And when we look at the little details like there was a resurrection of the dead, I believe that he's going to try to counterfeit that. And Paul is warning us, those who were alive, we're going to see the dead rise before we do. That's why he says that. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with a trump, okay, of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, excuse me, wherefore comfort one another with these words. Now, there's a lot of people out there today that would like to say, well, this is just a description of the rapture that happens before the tribulation. Okay. There's a couple of problems with that. There's no Bible verse that shows us that this is a separate event from when the, when the Christ actually returns. Okay. That concept is not found or specified anywhere in Paul's writings. In fact, what we're going to look at now is the idea or the little marker that he gives to us to show us that it is, in fact, the same as the return of Christ. Okay, so first thing to realize, there's no scripture that says this is a separate event from when Christ returns. People try to rationalize and say, oh, well, you know, this preacher of rapture has to be first. And then they go off of all of these traditional ideas or this bad theology and say, because of these that are extra biblical, the Bible has to fit my preconceived or my presupposed ideas, as opposed to saying, nowhere in Thessalonians does Paul say, this event happens, and then Christ comes back again later to get more people. Or this happens, and then he's going to come back and return to get the Hebrews. In fact, he gives us in verse 17, or no, verse 16, something very specific that we need to look at. When we first started this Bible study, your homework was to go and read Leviticus chapter 23. Because in there, we're given the seven appointed times of God, and one of those is called the Feast of Trumpets. Okay, now we're going to get into the history and what the Feast of Trumpets actually is, but first we're going to look at some scripture. Matthew 24, 30 and 31. This is the Olivet Discourse when the apostles had asked Jesus when he's going to return. And he goes into this discourse and says, all of these things are going to happen and then I'm going to return. And if we read it the way that it is written, the way that it is given to us, it's a linear chronology of the events that will happen leading up to his return and he says in matthew 24 30 and 31 he says at that time the sign of the son of man will appear in heaven and all of the tribes of the earth will mourn they will see the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and he will send out his angels okay with a loud trumpet call so there is a trumpet 
Jesus tells us himself there will be a trumpet call at his return when the angels are going to be sent out. And they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. Okay, 1 Corinthians 15.52, Paul is writing about the same event. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for a trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall all be changed. So Paul is telling us at this last trumpet, that is when we can expect the dead to be raised incorruptible. And then according to Thessalonians here, we will follow immediately after that. And based on what is being written between Matthew, 1 Corinthians, and Thessalonians, this is all at the same singular event of Christ's return. This is all anchored by this last trumpet. Isaiah 27, 13 tells us, in that day a great trumpet shall sound. And those who were perishing in Assyria will come forth with those who were in exile in Egypt, and they will worship the Lord on the holy mountain in Jerusalem. On that final day, there will be a trumpet that will be sounded, and those who were persecuted in different lands will come together to go up and worship the Lord in his mountain. This will be instigated at that trumpet call, that last trumpet. Revelation 10.7 tells us, But in the day of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound his trumpet— The mystery of God will be fulfilled just as he proclaimed to his servants and the prophets. So scripture is telling us that this event culminates at this final trumpet. There is going to be a trumpet call to announce that Christ is returning. The dead will be raised incorruptible and Thessalonians, Corinthians, Revelations, they are all pointing and tied to the same singular event. There is no verses that say that this Thessalonians letter is talking about a rapture and there's a bunch of activity in between and then Christ returns again later because there's not two final trumpets. There's not two last trumpet calls. Then how do we know this? Okay. We need to be able to uh, uh, contextualize or come up with the concept of when will this trumpet be blown? Okay. So before we look at the last trumpet, before we look at the Feast of Trumpets, before we dive into those details, I have just crammed a ton of information down all of your throats. Do you have any questions before we keep moving? Is everybody awake? Are you guys still with me? You guys alive? It's all good. I have something. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, Matthew 24, verse 29, specifically says after the tribulation of those days. And I think it's very important that we emphasize that because yeah. yes, right before. people will just blow right by it and miss the point that it's after the tribulation. Yep. It says immediately after the tribulation of those days, Shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. That concept, or this this event that happens where the sun's dark and the moon's the moon doesn't shine and the stars don't give their light, that's found in like twelve different places in both the Old and the New Testament. It's talked about by Paul. It's talked about by Jesus. It's talked about by Joel, Amos, uh, Zephaniah. Uh, I think Obadiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel. They all talk about this event. And then after that event happens, when the sky is darkened. Christ will return in his glory and the whole world will see it. Okay. That's why the concept of him being the brightness when he's in Jerusalem, there's not going to be day and night because of his brightness from there. This concept is the world is going to be ready for him to return and he's going to return and every, every living individual will see it that is alive because of the brightness and glory of his coming. And if you have any doubt that he's going to get confused with the sun, by the way, the sun's going to be darkened. The moon's not going to give any light and you won't even be able to see the stars. It's going to be, it's going to basically be pitch black and then Christ is going to return. Okay. There's no other event that happens where Christ comes back secretly to gather up his, those people that he loves and then leave other people behind. Right. We just don't see that. And we don't have time to tackle that. The timing of the the um, uh, the marriage supper of the lamb, um, what happens during the tribulation, who's afflicted. We don't have time to cover that today. That's more in line for your homework. And we'll hit that as we kind of work through the New Testament um, and some of the future studies. But just remember that it specifies things for a reason. We don't get to read in between the lines and make ideas fit and say, well, you know, it doesn't specifically say my idea is wrong, so I'm going to keep going with it, right? That's not using scripture to build your idea. So when we look at the trumpet being blown, we need to know when this last trumpet's going to be blown because Paul tells us we shouldn't be ignorant. 
right? He tells us again in, in the next couple of chapters and in his next letter, he says, you shouldn't be ignorant of the time because your children in the light. You should know the season of when I'm going to return. Matthew 24, 36 says, but that day or the hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. This title, the feast that no man knows the day or the hour of is another name for the feast of trumpets. This is why you needed to go and read Leviticus, because in Leviticus 23, it talks about the Feast of Trumpets is the first of the fall Moedim, the fall appointed times. Jesus fulfilled the ones in the spring, and when he returns, he's going to fulfill the ones in the fall. And the first one is the feast that no man knows the day or the hour. So when Jesus says, no man knows the day or the hour of my return, if you're a Hebrew in that audience, you're going to immediately recognize that that is the Feast of Trumpets. And we're going to talk about why. Okay. The Feast of Trumpets took place on the first day of the seventh month of the Hebrew calendar. And the only way that they knew that it was the first day of the seventh month was by the spotting of a new moon. So they would have to go out into the, count, into the country. They would have to look at the moon when it came up over the uh, uh, horizon. And they would have to be able to spot a small little itty bitty sliver of a new moon. And when they spotted that, they would declare this feast would be active. And if it was cloud cover over, if it, if it was like a Friday night and it was cloudy, they couldn't spot it. So they would have to wait until the next night to see if they could spot it. And then they would be able to declare the new month. And so no one knew when that was going to fall because they had to wait to spot the moon and that could fall between one of three days. So that's the first thing. This feast is the feast that no man knows the day or the hour of because you have to spot the new moon and there's no way to be able to know whether or not you're going to see it. You just have to hope you can see it. And if you don't, you wait until you do see it. And then once you do, you declare the new month. So the first day of the seventh month, which is called Tishri, is the beginning of the Feast of Trumpets. Okay. On the 10th day of the seventh month, if you read in Leviticus 23, you'll see that the, the 10th day is what's called Yom Kippur or the Day of Atonement or better understood as the Day of Judgment. So you have the Feast of Trumpets, and then 10 days later, you have the Day of Judgment. This is an important detail. Remember 10 days, okay? 10 days in between these two high holy days was called the Days of Awe. Okay, so they would take this time, this 10-day period, and they would reflect, and it would be a time of repentance. Okay, the Feast of Trumpets included blowing of the shofar, blowing of the trumpets. Okay. Now, the date, the month before the seventh month of Tishri, trying to make this as simplified as possible, is called the month of Elul, E-L-U-L. -L. It is the sixth month of the Hebrew calendar, and it is a 30-day period that has been set apart specifically for reflection and repentance. It is considered the month of mourning the month of repentance in preparation for the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Judgment. They would spend 30 days and they would get their quote-unquote spiritual house in order. They would read scriptures from Isaiah and from Psalms about repentance, about searching their heart. They would read those daily. They would go before the Lord with prayer and supplication and they would ask him and call upon his mercy. Okay, so you have an entire 30-day 30, 30 month leading up to the Feast of Trumpets, and then 10 days later, you have the Day of Judgment. So all in all, you have a 40-day period or a 40-day time of testing. How long was Jesus in the wilderness? Forty days. 40 days. He was in for 40 days. What was happening? He was being tested. He was being tried, right? On Elul 1, back when Moses was trying to get the laws from God up on Mount Sinai. God called Moses to the mount for a third time. And then Moses descended on the 10th of, of the seventh month with a second set of tablets and with God's assurance of forgiveness. So God is repeating this, right? On the, on the beginning of Elul, there's 30 days. It's repentance. It's a call for mercy. It's going before the Lord, searching yourself looking at your inner house, getting your spiritual life in order, and then it's leading to two high holy days, the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Judgment, so you have a 40-day period that's reminiscent of Moses going up to the mount and being up there for 40 days and then coming down with new with the, the new tablets and this promise of forgiveness. 
Okay, so we're building this case. The, the Hebrews have this time of testing leading up to these two high holy days. Now, these two holidays, these two appointed times that were given to us by God in Leviticus 23 are considered to not only be holy days, but they are high holy days. They are extra special and extra important. Okay, now starting at the beginning of the month of Elul, this is the sixth month before the Feast of Trumpets. It is customary to blow the shofar every single day until the day before the Feast of Trumpets. Okay, so this image of the Hebrews going before the Lord, being repentant, having a sorrowful heart, they blow the trumpet every day. Now, for those of you who were on the Bible study with my dad two weeks ago, what does a trumpet represent when it's blown? According to Revelation and what we see in Scripture. Does anybody know? Are you guys paying attention on that? Because they're not just blowing the trumpet for no reason. Is it warning? It's a warning. It's a warning. Okay. They were blowing the trumpet as a warning because on the Feast of Trumpets, there were some specific things that took place and they were warning themselves. The trumpet blasts were to wake up, realize when you live and realize what is coming down the pipeline. These are warnings that the king is going to be coming. You better get your spiritual house in order because judgment is just about around the corner. And if you don't do it, you're going to basically seal your fate. Okay. So are you guys still with me? We see the first day of the seventh month and the 10th day. We have this 10 day period, this days of awe, 30 days before that for the entire month previous. It's a time of repentance. It's a time of reflection and getting your spiritual house in order and going before the Lord for mercy and repentance. That whole 30 day period, they're blowing the trumpet saying, guess what's coming? The feast of trumpets and the day of judgment. Those are on their way. You guys better wake up out of your slumber and get out of your sin because this is happening. This is coming. Wake up. Okay. Now, based on the spotting of the new moon, that's how we know that the no man knows the day or the hour. If you guys want to go and Google that, don't take my word for it. Go Google the words, the feast that no man knows the day or the hour, and you're going to find a couple of links specifically about the Feast of Trumpets in Yom Teruah. Okay? Because it's very well known. We don't know it as Gentiles getting our foundation from the New Testament, but when you study God's word and you see what the Hebrews have done and how he's tracked those things, he has preserved that through the practices, even though they've messed a lot of them up, his truth is still there. So if we have the Holy Spirit, we'll find him. Okay. Now, Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, marks that 10-day period of self-examination and repentance. So they're blowing the trumpets. When the Feast of Trumpets finally shows up, there's now a 10-day period of self-reflection saying from here until the Day of Atonement or the Day of Judgment, whichever you'd like to call it, we're going to reflect. Because on the Day of Judgment, after that, there's no more reflection. If we haven't repented by then, we're done. Our fate, our fate is sealed. It's also referred to, so the Feast of Trumpet also goes by the name Yom HaZikaron, or the Day of Remembrance. This is a reference to the commandment to remember to blow the shofar to coronate God as king of the universe. So on the Feast of Trumpets, they blow the trumpet well over a hundred different times. And on the final trumpet blow, they are declaring that God is taking over as king of the universe. So it's an announcement that judgment is coming. And on the Feast of Trumpets, right? So those first 30 days, they're blowing the trumpets, saying the king is going to be returning. Make sure you're repenting because judgment day is coming as well. And then on the Feast of Trumpets, they blow the horns, the shofars over 100 times. And then they declare that Christ, or the Lord in this case, is going to come and he's going to take his authority and be king over all of the universe. Now, I want you guys to take the next section with a little bit of a grain of salt. But this is pulled from some of the Jewish practices and tradition that's been kind of preserved since some of the early writings. But on the Feast of Trumpets, the destiny of the righteous are written in the book of life and the destiny of the wicked are written in the book of death. However, most people will not be inscribed, meaning their names are not permanently put in either of those books. They have 10 days to repent until the Day of Atonement before they seal their fate. So we see that this 10 days of repentance is if you've decided that you're going to be a wicked person, you still have some time to repent. And then on that 10th day, you no longer have the chance to repent because your fate will be sealed. So if Jesus is telling us in scripture that I'm going to return on the, on the day that no man knows the day or the hour, right? That's when I'm going to return. And he says, I'm returning on the feast of trumpets. 
then we should expect scripture to be able to tell us some other events that fall in line with what happens on the Feast of Trumpets. The first being when he returns and the dead and those who are alive are transformed to be with him, we're taken to protection. And then we see the bowls of wrath and revelation poured out, but there's still a time of repentance for those people. And then on that 10th day, judgment takes place. And then the wicked are cast into hell and the righteous are brought into the kingdom, right? That's a very, very simplified overview of what we can see taking place. But if we know that the blowing of the trumpet means that judgment is coming, get your spiritual house in order. There's a 10 day period of awe coming that you really don't want to be on the wrong side of. And also on the Feast of Trumpets, we're going to blow the trumpet and we're going to announce that God has taken over as a rightful king over the universe. Then when we look at Revelation eleven fifteen and read it, it brings a little bit more context. It says, then the seventh angel sounded his trumpet. Let's try that again. And then the seventh angel sounded his trumpet and those... And there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. At the seventh trumpet, scripture tells us that Christ returns. Those who are his are transformed, taken into his kingdom. And then there is a 10-day period. And this is why I adhere to this concept that there is a pre-wrath tribulation, or not a pre-wrath tribulation, a pre-wrath rapture. Because Jesus comes on the Feast of Trumpets, and then 10 days later, judgment happens. And during that 10-day period, there is absolute warning and wrath and destruction because we see these bowls poured out over all of the earth. And this is the very, very last chance for anyone to turn to God. Right? If they haven't already accepted him at this point, odds are they probably won't. But we see something very specific. We have this church that's located in Smyrna that's written to in Revelation chapter 2. I want you to pay attention to this because he says, and unto the angel of the church in Smyrna wrote, these things says the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know your works and tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of them, which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear, none of these things which thou shalt suffer, behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you may be tried and you shall have tribulation for 10 days. Be faithful unto death and I will give you a crown of life. He that has an, he that has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. He that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. I believe this church in Smyrna is going to remain and be a, a, a very small remnant of people who come to know the Lord after this collection of the dead and those who are alive. Because he's telling them, Satan's going to try, he's going to throw you in jail and persecute you. You're going to go through the lowest of lows, but it's only for a 10 day period. I've got my eye on you. You're still going to be in my kingdom. So what we see here is God is still giving mercy, even through the end, up until the day of judgment, which according to the Old Testament and the New Testament, is the day of the Lord. Okay, this day of the Lord is a day of wrath, a day of fire, of destruction, of judgment, where God has said, my book has been sealed. If you are wicked, you're going to destruction, and I'm going to pour this out in order to clean things up so my son can establish his kingdom. Now, Without giving you illustrations and being able to fill in a lot of the gaps on that, again, we're condensing like, you know, five different three-hour lessons all into a quick, you know, 20-minute 20 uh, 20 little sample here. Does anybody have any questions on the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, the timing of that, Jesus' return, the judgment, or anything that we just talked about? Does anybody have any questions or we need to clear that up at all? I mean, I'm sure you guys do, but does anybody want to ask them <laughs> on the Bible study? Hey, real quick, the 10 days yeah. oh. for us to decide, What can you just re recap that real quick for me? Right, so we see that the concept based on what Paul is writing, what's in Revelation, what we see in Matthew 24, is that when Jesus returns on the day of trumpets, or on the feast of trumpets, right, that final trumpet is blown, Christ returns, he says, Paul says in Corinthians that when that trumpet is blown, the dead are transformed and we are risen. That happens, and we are basically taken to go see the Lord on the Feast of Trumpets. 
Okay. Now, there is a 10-day period for everybody else that's left on the earth where God is going to pour out his bowls of wrath that we see in Revelation where it gets super, super bad. And that period of time is going to be a very final warning call to say, you, this is your last chance to repent. If you don't do it now, your fate is sealed for eternity. And if anybody comes to know the Lord during that time, God has his eyes on them. And even if they're murdered and they're killed and they're persecuted for the name of the Lord, God still has enough mercy to see those people and accept them into his kingdom, right? But on that day of atonement, that's it. Story wraps up. You have no more chances to repent. Okay, if you're wicked, you're destroyed. We see that in Matthew 13. We see that concept in Matthew uh, 24 and 25. So if you're wicked at that point, you're destroyed. So we don't, as believers, we don't have to worry about that because that is God's wrath being poured out. Okay, and it and, uh, tells us in Thessalonians, we are not preserved to God's wrath. We are going to be freed from that wrath. So that 10-day period, we are okay. We're with the Lord. He's going to take us. He's going to protect us and put us somewhere safe. Well, all of this plays out for that 10-day period. And then on that day of atonement, that's it. Story's done. Wicked are going to be destroyed. And now Christ is going to establish his kingdom on earth. Right? We see this concept that the lamb pours out God's wrath. He's, he's basically clearing out the wicked. Excuse me. And those who come to come to salvation during that period of time, I believe, is the church in Smyrna that's written about in Revelations 2, verses 8 through 11. Because he says, you're going to suffer for 10 days. Don't worry, I still have my eyes on you. Does that make sense? So that 10-day period is a, basically a, a last call for anybody who's still left after Christ returns to get those who are his. Yes, thank you. Okay. So, and we'll obviously, like I said, this is, I'm not expecting you guys to just pick all of this up and run with it and understand it perfectly. You know, years and years and years have gone into studying this stuff. So what we're going to do is as we continue through Thessalonians, we're going to take some time to break these things down. And I'm going to hopefully be able to provide some illustrations for you so you guys can see the timeline and not just have to try to imagine it. Because it's super hard to try and picture it in your head if you don't have the concept of how the Hebrew calendar works, how the Moedim are structured, what they represent, things of that nature. But this should be your starting point to go and do homework. Okay? Go and research the Feast of Trumpets and what it represents. Okay? Go and study what this, the shofars mean, right? My dad did you all a favor if you were on the Saturday Bible Studies and talking about what those trumpets represent. Right, a warning call for what's to come. We can also talk about the fact that trumpets were a way that that the uh, Hebrew people would basically declare war and they would go and attack and defeat other nations, like we see with Jericho. Same concept. The trumpets are blown. Christ is saying, "I am the King. My kingdom is coming. I'm going to establish it now, and I'm going to be victorious." Right. So there's more than just you know, it's not just about the sin and repentance. It's not just about Christ establishing His kingdom. There's more to it. But Keep in prayer when you do study these things. Always seek after the Holy Spirit's guidance. Always look for good, biblically sound resources. And always, always, always make Scripture your standard. If someone is presenting you with these concepts and they're contradicting Scriptures that you know of, you got to be willing to dismiss them because you're not really hungry for truth if you're willing to accept things that don't line up with Scripture. Right? And that's the whole mentality of being a Berean. Right, doesn't matter who shares it, doesn't matter the idea, where it came from, how old it is, how well established or popular it is. If it's not in line with God's word, it's not his truth. And that's the end of the story. Okay. So that's your homework. Go study the Feast of Trumpets. Go study death. Listen to this recording again and go and read all of the Bible verses I gave to you and go and find all of the other Bible verses and formulate your ideas based on what those are saying. Right? Go and study and read what happens at death. Go and study and read what's going on. Um with the concept that the promise is that God's going to raise us from the future. So this should be just your starting point. Don't end today, but right? I have to give you this advice. Do not end today and just formulate your ideas based on what I've told you. Go and study scripture, be led by the Holy spirit and God promised he'll give you his truth. If you're hungry for it. Now I'm always a resource, right? The amount of time that I've put into this, I'm always going to be a resource. If you have questions, if you need extra things to look at or extra areas to address or any contradictions that you want to work through those types of things. So don't be afraid to reach out to me, but this is such an important concept because we are going to see this unfold in our life where 
all of the people who believe in the pre-trib rapture are not going to see the rapture. And they're going to see the Jewish people start with their sacrifices. And they're going to see the temple rebuilt. And they're going to see this man of perdition come to the earth, say that he is the Messiah. He's going to be performing signs and wonders and miracles. The Hebrews are going to love him. They're going to accept him because he's going to reestablish the Mosaic Covenant and the Levitical laws. And they're going to think that, well, this must be Jesus. Because he's doing miraculous things and he's performing supernatural signs and wonders. And then they're going to see him basically raise it up and say that he is God the Father and he should be worshipped. And the people who call themselves Christians are going to follow after it because they never studied eschatology to know what was actually going to happen. And they're going to be deceived because they weren't prepared. That's the falling away that we see. It's not a falling away because they get offended with, with Jesus or they get offended with the church. It's a falling away because they get deceived by the Antichrist and it fools the Hebrews and the Christians and the Muslims. So we are preparing ourselves for what's to come in the future. And hopefully there will be people that will say, well, I thought I knew what I was talking about. I guess I better go and find out what the scriptures actually say. And guess what? We can be sitting there saying, let me help you understand what this means. Let me help you with the wisdom of scripture. Because like what Daniel says, if we have that wisdom, God's going to use us as a beacon of light during those end times to help people understand what's going on. But we have to do the work and be diligent now. Okay, so don't take this lightly. Take this very seriously. Spend extra time during the week. Do your research. Do your due diligence. And if you need help, I'm a resource. Okay? So any questions on any of this, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. I am actually super surprised we made it this far. We can go ahead. Verse 17, the point that I wanted to make is that the dead and the living are caught up in the clouds to meet with Jesus. If we take Paul's words for what he says here in this section of scripture, he says that the dead are raised first and then the living are next. And if we just take that at face value, a rapture cannot happen because the living would have to go before the dead who were raised. And that's what we do with scripture is we take it at face value. Paul doesn't say there's a second event or there's something else that's going on. He says that the dead get to go see Jesus first. So we don't get to go and hang out with Jesus because that would be a contradiction to the revelation that Jesus gave to Paul. The dead go first, they're transformed. Those who are alive go next. We all meet Christ in the air. Those are our signals and signs that we, have, we are actually with the real Jesus and not with a counterfeit that's down here just giving us fake signs and wonders. Okay? So three questions are context of chapter four. Avoid sexual perversion, grow in love for others. And then Paul is also giving details on the return of Jesus. What we can see about God's character is that he expects us to be involved in our own sanctification. Okay? This is not a works-based salvation, so let's ask the question, how can we be involved in our own sanctification? What is our responsibility as Christians? Keeping our life consistent with Christ because sin dishonors God. That's correct. Excuse me. That's not. That means we're, sorry, my mic keeps cutting out. That means that we're not sitting back and just waiting for God to make sanctification happen. That means that we're actively going before the Lord in repentance. We're asking his Holy Spirit to convict us of things that we're holding on to. And then we take the next step and say, God, I'm bringing these to you. And I'm going to be involved and reject and deny my own flesh and understand that when I do that, you've promised to give me the power to see it all the way through. And don't be surprised when he steps up and breaks those chains, he breaks that bondage, and you completely lose the desire to even sin in some areas of your life because you know what it will do. And you've chosen to be close with him versus having a little bit of satisfaction for just a moment. Okay, so never forget that we are... We are responsible for taking initiative and sanctification and avoiding sin, and God has promised to meet us there. The other one is, for those who love the truth, God has provided clues and truth for his plan and for what his future actions entail, because he does not want us to be ignorant of what he is doing. Okay, we can look at all of the examples throughout Scripture, and we cannot really see any areas where someone didn't understand what God's plan for mankind was. We can see areas where maybe he hadn't revealed all of the plan or he had just given them a partial revelation and they shared it, i.e. Isaiah, Ezekiel, the minor prophets, Zechariah, Amos, Joel, Zephaniah, Nahum, right? All of those guys got a little bit of a witness, but we are at the end of the age where God is now revealing all of these as, a, as basically kind of an entirety so that we can be prepared for basically the worst conditions that mankind has ever seen or will ever see again. God does not leave his people unprepared 
to for the things that he's going to put him through. Okay, and that includes eschatology. And I will tell you, it is hard. But if you will, if you're willing to put in the time and you're willing to be led by the Holy Spirit, God has promised to tell us what those are. And Paul writes in more than one occasion. We should not be ignorant when it comes to these things. We should not just hope we're going to be okay for the future because it is going to be bad enough that it is going to fool the majority of the world. And if we do not prepare, we are going to be deceived by it as well. That's how bad it's going to be. Okay. Now the takeaway for me for that final question is I need to focus on sanctification. That is something that as Christians, we will never do too much of. Okay. So that we squeeze like, I mean, I really thought we were only going to get halfway through. So if you can't tell, I was really trying to blaze through that. We squeezed through like seven pages of notes there, six pages there. So I'll give it a last, uh, last chance. Any questions, comments, concerns, anything you guys want to address regarding anything that we talked about? I have just one. Hey, go ahead. Okay. First of all, the uh, <clears throat> if anyone wants to know what, the verse address is for that one about the soul and bo bo body. It's uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Yeah, 10, 28. He'll kill the body and the soul. Yep. And yep, then, and he's taught, uh, it's a reference to God. And go ahead. And thank you, sir. That was really good. Really good. Yeah. Well, I hope it was. I hope it was informational I hope it was enlightening a little bit like i said going through some of this stuff it's taken years and years and years to be able to connect some of these dots and it's only through god that i've been able to really understand some of this stuff because i'm not a hebrew i'm not a you know i don't know the hebrew language those aren't my it's not my forte i'm just a dude from tawilla who knows english and so doing that study has been really really hard and it's taken a lot of time but you know he's revealed those things through his through his word and you know test them Right. Be a Berean. Don't just take my word for it. Go and test all of this against scripture. I've recorded this. It will be in the chat so you guys can go back through and do your research, do your references, do your word search, do your cross references and go and find out more information about the um, the Moedim, the fall feasts, the Feast of Trumpets and the Feast of uh, or in the Day of Atonement. And that'll kind of contextualize some of the stuff we're going to see in Revelation. Like I said, we've got you know, stuff in Revelation, stuff in Daniel that we didn't even touch, that we didn't even cover, that all fill in the details of the Feast of Trumpets, what's going to be taking place. We can see in Revelation that there's stuff that's leading up to the Feast of Trumpets, these trumpets being blown, the things that are happening during these events. So, you know, as we as we uh, kind of stumble through this, we'll, we'll hit them. So don't think that this is a full argument for this belief that I have of a pre-wrath rapture. Uh, because there's much more to it, and hopefully we can hit these as we continue forward. Chapter 5 is also going to talk a lot about the same concept, so we're going to go a little bit further on some of these. Uh, but if you have any questions, shoot me a text, shoot me a message, let me know, and I'll be happy to spend some time, and um, we can work through some of the questions if you guys have any. Okay. Okay, last call for questions or comments. Okay, Lauren uh, didn't make the Bible study. She sent me a message saying that she had to deal with something with her daughter. They had to go to the ER. So um, she did request that we would keep her in prayer. Um, we don't really need to get into the specifics. Obviously, we can pray for her, but just keep her on your prayer list uh, these next couple of days um, that the Lord would um, do some work there and, and be able to be glorified in whatever's happening. Okay, so let's go ahead and close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that if we seek after your truth, if we're hungry for your understanding, that you've promised to pour that out into our lives. And we're thankful for the truth that you've given to us. We thank you for the revelation and the knowledge and understanding that you've already given to us in our lives. And we ask that you would use those to sanctify us, Father, and also to prepare us for the things to come. Lord, give us a strength and give us a courage to be able to seek your truth in spite of whatever it may cost. If it costs us relationships or if it costs us you know, having to walk away from truths that we've held on to our whole life or something that we thought to be true, Lord, that we would be able to dismiss those things for the, the truth that you've authored in your scripture, no matter the cost. You say that if we draw near to you, that you would draw near to us. So as we search your scriptures, as we study to show ourselves approved, as we study to rightly handle your word, we ask that you would glorify yourself in our, in our lives. 
that you would make us vessels that are usable for your will, for your glory, that you could fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you could trust us with your gifts, that you would help us to die to pride, Father, help us to die to ego, help us to not get too puffed up with the knowledge that you've shared with us, and that you would always keep us focused on your will and the purpose that we have while we're here. Help us to be courageous enough to share our testimony for those who are hungry. Help us to share your gospel and help us to defend your truth, not to be puffed up and to be about glorifying ourselves, but so that we can help others who are hungry for your truth and who are looking for you, that we can do it with a servant's heart. Lord, we need you to change our hearts. Use your Holy Spirit to convict us. Shine that light into who we are as people, who we are as individuals, to identify any shortcomings or any transgressions or any anything we've been disobedient in, anything that's been a shortcoming, that we could submit those to you and that we could be holy and righteous and set apart to walk after your footsteps. Be with us this week, Father. Give us opportunities to hear your voice and to be obedient to step out. We ask that you would touch the situation with Lauren and her daughter, Father, that whatever's taking place, that whatever's happening, that you would give them a peace and an understanding and a reassurance that you were in charge, that they just need to trust in you, that they need to follow after your direction, Lord. That whatever it is, Lord, we don't know, but you know. You are the author of everything. You can see what's going on, and you know what the situation needs. And we ask that you would interject into that, stick your hand, and reach into their lives, Lord. Help them to know that you're in charge, to build their faith and their understanding of who you are. We give you glory for what you've promised to do in our lives, if we're diligent. And we thank you for the work that you have done. We give you praise for everything in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.